Thank you guys. This is really exciting for our students that we have such a great group of adults that uh, helped to put an event on like this to showcase all the hard work that they did. And tonight is all about these talented kids and what they've put together. So I'm really looking forward to the show and I know all of you are too. So welcome to Granite Hills and here we go on to our next interview. I'm going to do a real quick welcome speech uh, um, just to really thank some people that have been instrumental in making this. And uh, th by the way, this is the third annual GUHSD Film Festival. So we're super pumped that this has become an annual event. And uh, we're, we keep changing schools from year to year. Year one was Valhalla, year two at Santana, year three here at Granite Hills. And we look forward to doing this year four next year. We know this has been a crazy and wild year, guys. We've had students trying to make films from home in full distance learning without their teachers present. Um, that has been uh, hard for the kids, hard for the teachers, but I kind of feel like none of these kids came into high school saying we're professional filmmakers. Some of them didn't even know they were filmmakers at all. They came in, they found a little bit of a spark in the beginning of high school in the AME pathway. And over the three years of the pathway, it's really grown into a full forest fire from that spark. And that's what you're going to see here tonight is these student films um, that they've worked on pretty much their whole year, the, this, this school year. I'd um, like to thank uh, GUHSD administration and college and career readiness. Uh, Paul Dautremont. Yep, thank you. Uh, Director Eileen Bag Rizzo. Director Tracy Wilson, Esteban Monje, Jamie Davenport, Joanne Johnson, and the rest of the College and Career Readiness Support staff. Thank you guys for always supporting what we're doing. Um, they came to us and said, hey, you know what? We have a little bit extra money this year. We can help you. We got this giant screen, so we were super pumped to get that. Um, it's just getting dark enough back in the distance to see the uh, Hollywood movie night spotlights that are uh, up and running and that'll look really cool with the cloud cover as we as we get darker and darker also I'd like to thank all the teachers from the AME pathway John Owens from Valhalla Lucas Riley from Santana Daniel Fer uh, Furious and Al Guerra from Granite Hills for their commitment to making this uh, part of their curriculum each year and uh, you know seeing these uh, at the end of the year is the, is the coolest thing. Personally for me, I want to thank Emilio Martinez who probably hates me today because I, <laughs> I've been running this guy ragged all day long back and forth the Elkhorn Valley. Uh, I also like to thank one of my best friends in the world, Mike Batamy. Uh, if you guys know Mike, he, has, um, he runs a video production business here in San Diego called 8 East Inc. Uh, they've got all sorts of cool projects going on. Check out their website. Um, but Mike has been a, um, an advisor for the AME Pathways now since we started this, uh, about six years now. And this guy gives his time. He doesn't get paid for any of this. He doesn't ask for anything in return. He just donates his time because he loves the school district, he loves this program, and he loves to see students being creative with filmmaking. Thank you, man. Finally, I'd like to thank the CTE AME Pathway students. Without you guys, we would have nothing to do here. You guys have been amazing all day today. Everybody who's helped me today, and I don't want to start naming people because you guys know me. I was trying to remember people's names earlier. Uh, I was a train wreck, right? So everybody who's been here today and helped out on this stuff, everybody who's in these classes, thank you guys very much. Is there anybody else who needs to say anything before? Would you come forward, Miss Eileen Bagrizzo? And Mr. Paul Dautremont. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a minute and thank all of our AME students on their accomplishments. We're really excited about their films and thank the teachers that have been working with them this year. You guys have all done an amazing job. Um, tonight we have a surprise. Could Mike Batamy please come up? Mike? Where everyone can see you. <laughs> 
so I had this whole thing written out about Mike Badamy, and Brent Ford just told you everything that I was going to say. But one of the things I would like to say on behalf of the Grossmont Union High School District and the College and Career Readiness Office, we would like to recognize Mike Badamy as the Grossmont Union High School District Business Partner of the Year. Wow. So congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Um, some of the things that Brent didn't tell you is that Mike, he has been working with our AME Pathway students for six years and he does guest speaking, he comes in and does lessons with them, he shares his expertise, he's an Emmy Award winner and it's amazing to have that kind of talent coming in and helping with our classes and our programs. Um, each year we have advisories and the advisories are integral to make sure our programs stay industry current and Mike is at every one of them and giving us his advice and help with equipment purchase. So our programs are state of the art and industry current and it's because of people like Mike. So we just want to say thank you very much. We have a plaque for you and Mike is going to be recognized at the June board meeting for the Grossmont District. Normally, uh, around this time of the year, we do an event called Champion, Champion of Champions, where we recognize students, staff members, and also our industry partner of the year. So um, normally we would be doing this in a you know, more formal setting, but like Brent said, this year has been pretty uh, abnormal. So Mike, thank you for everything you do for the Grossmont Union High School District and our CTE pathways. And we have um, a couple of small tokens of our appreciation. That first, looks like a big token. Well, this is a big token, yeah. First, and, and believe it or not, I these mean, are these were made by our manufacturing pathway, our advanced manufacturing pathway at West Hills High School. Really? So again, strong CTE connection. I'll take it. So we have a little pin here on Ooh, here that, that recognizes you it. with your name on it. It's my first name pen in my whole life. Well, first and last name. We, we went all the way. And you spelled my name right. <laughs> I mean. Well, probably, yeah, like five iterations. But. Thank you. And then also we have a plaque here that says um, it has our 100-year anniversary logo on the top, which we're using on everything this year because this is the 100-year anniversary of the Grossmont Union High School that. District. Wow. Yeah, it is. Wow. Um, so on here it says CTE Business Partner of the Year, Mike Badamy, um, 8 East Media Productions, and has our College and Career Readiness logo, and of course for the year 2021. So, Mike, thank you, sir, for you, and thank you for everything oh. you do, as as we have already stated. All right, let's get the show going. Thank you, guys. Okay, sweet. We're here with Yoni Mati from El Cajon High School and his film, Eye Gaze. <laughs> All right, so what was your favorite part in making this film? My favorite part of making this film was that it gave me another opportunity to share my life experience with others. I often do presentations to different groups of people telling them how my life has changed over the years and people seem to like hearing my story. Alright, and then if you could film on any location, where would you want to film? If I could create films anywhere, it would be at a park with a lake. I think lakes are beautiful, and I love all the open space the park has to offer. My name is Yonan Matty, and I am 18 years old. I am currently a student at El Cajon Valley High School. I want to start out by telling you a little about my life before starting high school. I was born in Mosul, Iraq, where I lived there for 12 years. There were no schools for me while we lived in Iraq. Other kids went to school, 
but I wasn't able to because of my disability. There are not many resources for people with disabilities in Iraq. For example, there was no technology to help me communicate. Therefore, my family always had to play a guessing game as to what I wanted to communicate. Despite some of the issues in Iraq, my life there was not bad. This is because I have the best family that you could imagine. We moved to America when I was 14 years old. This is where my life completely changed. The first major difference was that people were speaking a language I had never heard before. English. The next major difference was that I got to go to school for the first time in my life. I absolutely love going to school and if I could, I would skip the weekends and holidays and go to school every day. I have taken lots of classes at school. Some of my classes are in special education and some of them are in general education. I participate in everything I can. My teacher could tell from the very start that I was smart and they worked really hard to figure out how I could communicate with other people. They tried many different methods and although these methods were helpful, they were not perfect. I kept getting frustrated because I couldn't say what I wanted to say. Then, my teachers tried an eye-gaze machine with me. They has me using a machine owned by the district. They could not believe how good I was at selecting items on the computer screen with my eyes. In addition to being able to use the device to talk to other people, it also allowed me to participate in learning activities. Here is a video of me selecting words based on the sound of the first letter in the word. One of the happiest days of my life was when my very own IGAS device was delivered to my house. Medi-Cal provided the funding for this. This is what I had to say to everyone when that happened. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> frustration I have with communicating is that the device I have now does not allow me to communicate outdoors. As you can see, I love being outdoors and my favorite thing to do is go to the park and feed ducks. I also like taking pictures and videos when I am out and about. I heard that there is a newer model that will allow me to communicate outdoors. I really hope I can get this new one soon. Another thing I really love is doing presentations about my life and how technology has helped me be able to communicate. I have presented to several different universities as well as the high school I attend. I have even presented to elementary school students and they love it. I really like it too. I hope to do more presentations in the future. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. All right. So following that inspiring film by Yonu Matsi, we have Joseph Holt's surfing film from Granite Hills High School. All right. So what's your favorite part of being a film director? Um, honestly, it was nice to be the film director because I could handle everything that I wanted to handle. Um, I didn't really have, I didn't have any actors, um, and I had one person help me on the camera when I wasn't um, there on the camera. Um, but I liked being uh, in control of 
uh, what I wanted, how I wanted to look, and then the editing and everything. Um, it was cool to do it all kind of by myself. Yeah. All right, and then if you could film on any location, where would it be and why? Um, I want to film in Tahiti or Hawaii. Um, I really want to go someplace cool. Um, and then I want to see the culture in Tahiti, what the people are like. And then I want to uh, obviously go surf, but that's a pretty gnarly wave to go surf. Um, I don't know. I want to go somewhere that's beautiful and tropical, and I can go film the heck out of it. Yeah. Awesome. When I started surfing, I was about seven years old. Um, my dad, we were in Virginia because we were a military family, and I was seven years old. He took me to Virginia Beach, and we went and caught my first wave. It was a longboard. My grandpa still has that longboard today. Um, it's the West Wind uh, board. That's what we call it. These are my boards, and they're my favorite boards that I've owned of all time. Um, uh, of course, I have a foamy just in case, you know, there's literally nothing. Um, I don't know where I was going with this. Oh, roll the film. I got into surfing, um, mainly my friends. My dad always wanted to go, and then I never wanted to. And then later, my friends started to go, and I was like, well, you know, I'm gonna hang out with my friends, so I might as well go. And I started going, and I wouldn't really go outside. And then I finally started going outside, um, way out, you know. I started riding bigger waves and actually surfing. I moved down in board size. I had a board that was bigger than this one, and I started moving down. This is my smallest board. And it is also my favorite. It's a sci-fi, and I love it so much. Um, but I just was able to move lower and lower and lower uh, as time went on. I work at Rip Curl right now. I um, got a bunch of free shirts when I joined, but uh, I love that job working at a surf store. It's super duper cool. And before I was working at a surf school or a surf store, I was working at the surf school, and um, it's actually right here and uh, I was a surf instructor for about eight months. I, I taught kids from about like four years old to you know super old people um, and it was just super cool to, to meet all these people and then teach them how to surf and see the enjoyment that they that I have that they now get to experience when they go and surf and uh, I don't know that's just something special about surfing.
All right, so one more time, we have Perla Guzma from Santana High School with her film, The Toe Tapper. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then what was your favorite part of being a filmmaker? Uh, probably getting to shoot um, or film with my sister and then my family members. Gotcha. And then what is your most liked film genre? I try to do like comedy kind of. I don't really try to film things that are too serious, like lighthearted things. I like to do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paulina Posh. Since the day I was born, I've been toe tapping. You see, I have this extremely rare condition. Only one in one billion people get diagnosed with this condition every 10 years. And I just happen to be that one in one billion. I have toe tapness syndrome. I can't control when my foot decides to start tapping. It just happens. It has ruined so many opportunities for me to make friends or even be seen as normal when I do everyday tasks. Because of my condition, no one wants to befriend me or even be seen near me. I'm a loner. Toe tapness syndrome has taken over my life. I need to get rid of this toe tapness syndrome. But how? After transferring her toe tapness syndrome to her finger, Paulina Posh moved on to be a world-renowned author for her autobiography, The Toe Tapper and Me, at the age of 20, selling over 2 billion copies in countries such as China, the United States, and South Korea. She now searches worldwide for others who have toe tapness syndrome and helps them get through it as well. Paulina's bully at the bus stop ended up living on the street after they lost their job for mocking their boss and co-workers. The bully at the bus stop also ended up with Paulina's clothes after Paulina had donated them to Goodwill. Ladies and gentlemen, next up is Michael Soares from Valhalla High School. His film, The Time Capsule. Hi, Michael. Hello. Hi. Hello. All right. So, describe your filmmaking style. Well, I absolutely love it when a camera becomes a character. Nowadays, we see the characters on screen. The camera follows them all along. The director has no vision. He just follows the camera along, and that is unacceptable. I believe the camera should be a character. <laughs> I totally understand that. And why do you think that music is so important in film? 
music is the real director. Mm -hmm. You notice it a lot in editing, editing to the beat of the music. And in the end, while we can wander, our eyes can wander away from the screen, the music will always be there. So the music will always be the one who is sort of manipulating our emotions. Yeah, I totally understand that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think one of the greatest traditions of any school I've ever known of is whoever decided to start murals with the very first graduating class at Valhalla. I graduated from Valhalla in 2006. I teach uh, SAI history and I'm also the yearbook advisor and the swim and dive coach here at Valhalla. Really, I think our senior mural um, just depicted all of the things that happened throughout the year. We had a really awesome homecoming that year, so there's images from homecoming. They're just supposed to reflect the history and the experiences students had uh, their last year here at Valhalla. We had some aftermath from Hurricane Katrina. We were coming out of an election year, um, so some of that information is on there. One of my fast favorites is the most recent one that Brady Francisco did, kind of single-handed we really did a good job of capturing what was going on in Valhalla in uh, such a weird year of 2020. Right after winter break, I kind of just wanted to start picturing how I, how I thought the mural should look. I always started randomly pitching stuff to our senior class president, Haley Kasadish, and hoping one of them would stick and she would say, uh, yeah, go ahead, Brady, you can be in charge of it. All the murals are done each year. Our art teacher, who happens to be Mrs. Allen, uh, meet with a combination of both senior class officers and art students and just any student who's interested in being part of the mural. We wanted um, the prom venue to be on the mural. We wanted something to do with Disneyland. We wanted something to do with our CIF teams. But ultimately, once the pandemic hit, we couldn't do any of those in uh, in the light that none of those things happened. So this last year, they started that process on Zoom, and there was this idea, oh, well, maybe we could take the pieces of the mural to individual kids, they paint their part, we move it around. We ultimately decided that we didn't want to risk having to um, compromise the quality of the mural just so that we could all paint it. But Brady, who is our ASB president, had extensive experience in digital arts. I offered to paint it digitally. Every mural prior to this, for the most part, had been drawn out by hand. It's not uh, paper to pen or paintbrush to canvas like we've seen in other ones. I think the 2020 mural is really a representation of where we're going in this world, going to a completely digitized mural. To me, my wife was in the first graduating class, so these murals uh, go back all the way, and it's the continuity, the mark that each class leaves. And as far as personal meaning goes, as far as being an artist myself, that's always up to interpretation. My computer, not being like the best computer in the world, could barely handle opening in Photoshop. I just helped them get the right image size resolution and color space. It was originally just the, the 49 inches by whatever inches uh, Photoshop file. You have to take an image like this and then figure out how to blow it up. But I realized right away that, oh no, it's not all gonna fit. And then make sure that the student set up Photoshop in order to work at the proper resolution so the print would be high quality. So I split it up into three different files, rendered out to two gigabytes. And Brady worked for months painstakingly putting that together and pulled out, I just think, an amazing mural. Hats off to hitting it on the deadline and um, actually achieving success. I'm most proud of uh, how the eyes turned out. So one of the initial ideas was uh, to have the eyes of T.J. Eckelberg from the hit novel, uh, The Great Gatsby. I wanted that to be the focal point. Those represent the eyes of God in the novel, and I thought in the current era, eyes of God could be symbolic of many different things in many different contexts. I think he did a great job of capturing the national events. There's. Uh, uh, George Floyd, for instance, um, a lot of the protest movement. Um, we have Joe Biden on there, the impeachment ar articles used in Donald Trump's trial. The nurse or the doctor um, in the background with full face shield and full gown, I think that was really um, a strong look at really how that, just that act of COVID defined that whole class. The hotel, the U.S. Grand, that we were originally going to have prom in, 
Kim Jong Un kind of faked his death in one part of the year. <laughs> but again, he was able to bring it back home to Valhalla. We have lots of our sports teams and our award winning band team, choir. They took a trip to Japan right before quarantine hit. We also have Kobe Bryant and his daughter, Gianna. Kobe Bryant was uh, a large part of a lot of our childhoods. There's um, some in memoriam references to our friend Paul Valadez. He, uh, he passed away our freshman year. I know a lot of people that did uh, love him and were good friends with him. And, it's, and we just had to include him in the mural. Alumni who come back and visit, and maybe it's been 20 years, 30 years, or really we're getting up to 50 years. I hope that they uh, they'll recognize that while we had the pandemic, we still had a unique high school experience and that we still had each other and we still had fun and we still had class and we still learned a lot in high school, even though we were uh, stuck in our little quarantine bubbles. Them being able to see and remember that it's a visual time capsule that brings back so many memories, whether they're good or bad. And I think for anyone, it'd just be exciting to see and remember what those memories are. Uh, next up from El Cajon Valley High School is Derek Robinson with his film, The Dark Side. All right, hi Derek. What's up? So we have a few questions for you here today. Uh, what was the process like of naming your project? I know it kind of varies between filmmaker to filmmaker. Uh, the process was just trying to capture the never ending cycle and unfortunate reality of being black in America. Mm -hmm. And then where do you see yourself in five years from now? Uh, in five years, I see myself working as a, in a hospital as a nurse, as a nurse. That's awesome. All right, thank you so much. All right, thank you for having me. All right, and now is film The Dark Side. Journey of a thousand miles begins with one. They beat us, they slaughter us, but where do we go? Every turn we take, it leads down the same road. My ancestors fought for this, so I won't give up. The system has this hold on our necks, just like George Floyd's death. Do I need to start wearing a vest for all these bullet holes aimed at my chest? I'm just trying to invest in the right future, but they just want to see us in debt. If you hear this and take offense, you're part of the problem. A lot of us just want to Count checks and go with the flow. Still from a culture that ain't even yours. Black America, it's a beautiful thing, but a scarce reality. When you get seen as a threat with every ongoing step, for years we were called a slur, and it hurts. But when we turn a negative into a positive, everyone that's not us wants to get hurt. Like you weren't there in the dirt, getting worked until your back muscles couldn't even work, with no compensation. We had to work our butts off just to get emancipation. But that wasn't the end, not even by a long shot. We still in a rut. With all the rioting and the protesting, we still ain't heard. Ignorance is a crazy thing. A lot of you want to say, what about all lives matter? But ours don't? What kind of thicken is that? Isn't that hypocrisy? Oh wait, it don't matter when you're black. And standing out here in preparation for what can be something that will send loving vibrations out to the entire universe. All right, so first for you, Aiden. Oh, that's uh, Aiden, I'm Nate. Oh, oh, never mind, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> what was the most challenging part of making this film? Um, the most challenging part would have been the amount of files that ended up getting corrupted, blurred, or just unusable. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And then also, what's your favorite part of being a filmmaker? Without a doubt, the editing as I'm able to just experiment as much as I want until the deadline, at least. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then...
What was the process like naming this project? Um, a lot of it is, I wanted to come up with a name that really encapsulated the whole idea of the da of dance getting canceled for a lot of the seniors last year mm -hmm. and even the people who uh, couldn't come and do it at the start of this year in their senior year without going with uh, too much words, without it being a mouthful. Mm -hmm. And I really felt that uh, just the word offstage encapsulated that very, very well. Yeah, great. And then where do you see yourself in five years from now? Uh, five years from now, hopefully uh, somewhere in the industry of uh, sports media, sports broadcasting, maybe even to the point where I'm even calling games for uh, some team somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Good luck. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. By closing schools, we, we are contributing to the effort uh, to reduce large gatherings, to contribute to social isolation. Um, but again, our full intention is to bring our students back to school on schedule uh, directly after spring break. I thought that we were just gonna have a couple weeks and then spring break and then we would come back. All of us were excited when we found out we would get two weeks off of school. We had just the extended spring break at the start of it and so it was kind of nice, you know, to get like an extra few weeks. I think my initial feelings were confusion and uncertainty, but I was really positive towards still having a show. Um, but as we know, that wasn't the case of what happened. Everything just stopped and it was really upsetting. I like was kind of unsure if we were going to get to go back or not. So everyone was kind of like uncertain and we were starting to worry about like how we would learn our material and stuff like that. And we're all a really close family in the dance program. So having it just stop and not being able to see anyone anymore was really hard. So um, during that four week time period, because I'm such a planner, I came up with plan A, B, and C. Plan A was having the show as we know it, plan B was adjusting it in some capacity, and then plan C was gonna be completely virtual. Everyone on their own time, we gathered enough space and everything in our own houses, and we recorded all of our dances. I quickly learned how to edit <laughs> videos, which I'm not very skilled or talented at. We had all our choreography already set in place, so everyone already knew everything. Students submitted every dance number that they were in, and I think I spent 80 plus hours putting the show together, and we did a virtual Zoom. Last year, um, like over summer, it was like, oh, like, you know, we gotta get off early at the end of the year, and I originally thought like we were going to have a senior year. Um, that was not the case. As we move forward to this year, I did the exact same thing. Plan A, B, and C, and okay, quarter system. How do I adapt that to quarter system? Um, how do I keep the curriculum what it was and what the students were used to and looking forward to, um, but adapt it to be able to do this kind of production, this kind of production, or this kind of production, and still keep that excitement and um, community program feeling that we had. Miss White kept the dance program going as much as she could. We choreographed and we taught each other. For me, I am a pretty like strict deadline-oriented person and teacher and educator and so um, it's been good for me to have to learn how to adapt and have that um, leeway in planning. I film myself doing everything ahead of time, breaking down each step and then doing a little bit with the music, breaking it down, adding on, doing a little bit with the music. Out of that, I think my choreography personally was really impacted by that because I think it helped me a lot. And then once we went to um, one day a week in class, um, we got to work with some other dancers and we like worked together and every day she would have us do warm-ups at home and stretching to keep up on our technique and everything. I have to say because we were already dealing with distance learning, hybrid learning, and having all of that on top of the construction, I don't feel that it's hit, the construction side has hit us as hard. It hasn't really affected me because there's still a place where we can go all together and dance with our friends, even though we're social distance. Smaller numbers of students at school each day, we were able to grid out the room and use poly spots to make sure everyone has that safe distance and um, just an area where they can dance and develop and um, find new ways to dance in a smaller space. So it's like the same experience for us, except we're not dancing in front of a mirror, which helps us correct ourselves sometimes, but Miss White corrects us and helps us, so it makes it a lot easier. I think one of the biggest challenges is coordinating 
what students are on what day and then what dance numbers I can do on those days. This year we had to keep doing those same kind of things. Using quarter two to prepare for some kind of production in quarter four, which we will be doing some kind of production, but it'll be using film. Well, there's definitely a lot of stuff we're unsure about. We're trying to plan a show for our spring show, but we're not sure how that's gonna turn out since we can't have that many people in the, um, in the ballroom or stuff like that. So we're trying to figure out ways we can still perform for an audience. These programs are still alive and we are still working through this pandemic and we are still producing art even at a distance. We took all that choreography and now we are doing it in this upcoming show, which we are allowed to record in the theater in groups of 13. Even though COVID like kind of stopped us, like we still kept going and that was nice to know. You know, when I first saw it, I, I, I thought to myself, <laughs> This is going to ruffle some feathers. Um, you know, uh, Howard Zinn and kind of inspired film. And, and I, you know, I thought and reflected on that. And I was like, well, good. That's, I, I think that's one of the things that makes film so powerful is that you can get your message out there. And it really speaks volumes to uh, the, the power of this, this medium. Uh, the other thing that I thought about it is uh, filmmakers often fall victim to to gas, which is gear acquisition syndrome. And this guy put together a really powerful film with a really strong message using open source media and, and, a, and a Chromebook, you know? And I'm just really impressed by it. Uh, I definitely want to, uh, unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, but still wanted to uh, uh, air this film and, uh, and enjoy. American dream, the perfect way of life and concept. Work your whole life and contribute to society. A society that is divided. A society that upholds 1% of its population like New Age Kings. A society that convinces you anyone can make it. Anyone can do that 1%. But in reality, they will do anything to keep the rest down for their gain. Money is power and the systems in place uphold a social norm that many believe they must obey. For those who don't obey are those who do not deserve to be here. They are radical scum that want to see the world burn. The people are so focused on keeping their freedoms written on a piece of paper 200 years ago that they don't realize that they were never there to begin with. We are puppets in a greater scheme with a purpose to work boost the economy, make money. Don't live life to the fullest or think outside the box because you won't make it. You won't survive the test of life. Everything is a distraction from the truth. The people are bound by their own ideals and an internal war rages on, a forever burning fire fueled by hate for another belief. The people are divided by politics, forced to choose from two opposing sides while we fight the politicians act. While we are distracted by internal affairs, we are blind to the effects our modern day imperialism has on the world. Occupy and spread fear in the Middle East for opium and oil, and we wage war to protect our freedom, they say. We exploit the workforce of Asia because it's cheap labor, yet we have no regard for their safety and well-being. We call South America underdeveloped when we overexploit their land, their land which is rich in resources, yet the people are poor. And when they try to take back their means of production, our politicians fund coup d'etats and put dictators in power.
fund wars and justify them with quote unquote spreading democracy. But the truth is America is no democracy. We use that word to make our wrongdoings feel right. We let our presidents get away with heinous acts as if it preserves the American way of life. Democrat or Republican, we are in the wrong and blindly follow our politicians as if they didn't weasel their way to the top. We put them on a pedestal that they don't deserve. Their job is only to preserve the workings of the country and feel the idea of patriotism. To be a patriot, you must conform and respect authority, even when they show time and time again that they can care less about the people. We are just vessels to feel their reach of power. This country is the primary aggressor towards its people. The enslavement of black people and their continued segregation after, the unspoken genocide of the native peoples of this land and the continued erasure of their culture following. That is just the tip of the iceberg with many more mistreatments throughout its history. We have been indoctrinated from a young age to believe that we are the best country, that the past is the past and it should be forgotten. The system has clearly been flawed since the beginning. America doesn't run on freedom and liberty, it runs on fear and loathing. It's the people's duty to blindly fund and support the atrocities America enacts within the homeland and to the rest of the world. The American dream isn't a beautiful thing. It is ugly, tainted by blood, cruelty, and greed. America, the home of the manipulative and the manipulated. Check, check, one, two. Hey, our next filmmaker is from El Cajon Valley High School, Soldana Afra. Will you please come to the red carpet? All right. So, describe your filmmaking style. Uh, I usually like to work by myself because I'm able to put all of my uh, ideas into one concentrated area. Oh, I don't know what I'm talking like. Um, I like working with groups. It's just sometimes people have different ideas of what makes a film good. Some people want to make like, uh, you know, like movie star films. Mm -hmm. I usually just like to capture everyday life in a like a pink lens. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I usually like to work by myself. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And also, why do you think that music is so important in filmmaking? I feel like editing and lighting and character development only go so far in making a film good. I feel like music really sets the tone for how scenes are portrayed. Like even in like a like this seems extreme, but like even in like a murder scene, depending on what kind of music it could be, it could either be that this is you know this is like the beginning of someone going like crazy, and this is like kind of flippant to watch. I guess I don't know mm -hmm. if that's the right word, but no. or it could be like this is like the their height of their insanity and it's a serious scene i don't know how to explain it but it's kind of like that yeah it's totally make or breaks the scene yeah all right thank you so much another day another assignment how to be motivated motivation feels like searching the 10th bar of the google search engine Oddly specific, I know. You haven't quite started. You are far from the end, yet you feel you're already too far gone to find anything. Motivation is like a blast of whiteness in a room of black. It's blinding to an extent. It lightens your face faster than you agree. But in the end, all light is still engulfed by darkness. You must come to an end searching 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 
searching for a light that is no longer there until it comes again against your will. It escapes again just as quickly. With the loss of motivation comes an array of emotions, comes anger, comes glee, comes elation, but it's a vicious cycle. You can't be happy. You fall prey to the never-ending cycle that is seeking motivation. Painted colors, all except white. Hey! Get over yourself. Do you know how crazy you sound right now? Motivation is like using floaties in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and you're just allowing yourself to be moved by currents. This isn't the Titanic. You are in control of your life. Now just do it, okay? Get, get it? Nod with me. Um, next up is our good friend Landon Steams from Santana High School with The Voyager. Landon, are you with us? Yes. Welcome. All right, sweet. Yo. What's the longest amount of time you've spent on any sort of filmmaking? Uh, this, this film was the longest I've ever spent on anything that I've made. Uh, I started a while ago. It probably took at least like a month of like time. Oh, sheesh. Just like a month, yeah. How it's, long for like the editing process? Just editing, time? well, this film is like, it's all on green screen. There's, there's like, like everything you see really is just uh, something that I had to make mm -hmm. in the background. So yeah, it's, all of it was basically editing and like visual effects and all that. Right. I can't wait to see it. And also, where do you see yourself in five years? In five years? Well, uh, I, well, uh, I want to pursue this kind of thing, like video editing and all that. This is really like a visual effect thing, but I, I just like the editing part. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, in the exact same way. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. of my home world, I have devoted my life to bringing it back. For centuries, I have been searching for the perfect planet. In an endless sea of rock and unintelligent life, What I never expected during my voyage was to be led to the perfect planet, willingly, by its own people.
resources. Susceptible beings. Perfect. figure has been soaring past buildings in Metropolis. Military personnel are en route. Evacuation is recommended. Finally. The perfect planet. Um, our last film for the night comes from Valhalla High School. Uh, Jamil Armstrong and uh, Michael Soares. Could you guys come up and talk about guidance? All right, so... What was your favorite part in making this film? Um, I would say my favorite part of making this film was just the creative process and the scheduling and all the counselors coming at once to help us create this amazing film. And, you know, I just want to say thanks to my teacher, Mr. Owens, for giving us his full arsenal of technology, camera equipment. You know, this was a joint effort by everybody, the staff. So I, just, I would just say the creative process. It means a lot to me and I'll cherish it forever. Mm -hmm. And then, what would you describe your filmmaking? My apologies. No, you're fine. What would you say your filmmaking style is? My filmmaking style? Well, um, I make like skits, like comedy skits, so like, you know, <laughs> just stupid, weird stuff. But like, I would just say something that is um, relatable to people and something that can, you know, impact people in more ways than one. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great night, guys. Uh -huh. You can choose what this unprecedented time for the pandemic generation will mean to you. It's just been a really hard year for everyone. And so I think we easily forget that students and families are still going through struggles. As counselors, we work in three domains, the academic domain, the college and career domain, and the social emotional domain. We spend a lot of time really at both ends of high school, right? Helping those incoming ninth graders get acclimated to high school and understand what it's all about, earning credits and all that kind of fun stuff. And then students on their way out as well. We spend a lot of time helping them figure out what's next in life. I became a counselor to really support youth. My passion is really around supporting the mental health of our students and definitely those students that are more at risk or have um, challenges both at school and at home are really what I'm passionate about doing. School districts across the county will close on Monday to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. This is a critical new phase for California. It's totaling up to 30 school districts that will be closing, and that includes charter and private schools. And today, students were asked to pack up their backpacks, their school supplies and books to head home. It was a little shocking. Um, none of us have ever been through a pandemic before and didn't quite know the scale. Um, of what this would turn into. And so I remember a distinct moment on campus where we were saying goodbye to certain teachers and having that moment of realization that this may be the last time that we would see them for the rest of the school year. It kind of took all of us a little bit by surprise, but there was also, I think, a little bit of us similar to students of this idea of an extended spring break. You know, that always sounds fun, but when things started to settle in and the reality of it really hit, um, it was kind of this moment of, well, what are we gonna do? Um, I'd say we've definitely seen an increase in mental health issues. I think the isolation at home has been really hard on students, um, especially if they don't have as much support at home. And I think as a counseling team, we were just very concerned for the welfare of our students, um, especially those who we knew are just home wasn't 
the best place to be always. Not having that opportunity anymore to be here with us and, and have the supports that we try to put in place for students here, I think definitely contributed to that. School was a refuge, because I think that school is a refuge for a lot of students. We were all kind of waiting for answers from the district as well. Um, we oftentimes don't know much more than what families know. We're still in that, I think, crisis mode, right? Where we really don't know, uh, can't project to the future. We're, we're taking hearing about things one day at a time. We were anticipating we would stay at at least the same level, if not more in person. So we do have that in the back of our minds as we plan for the future. I think for our students um, in a regular school year, they're managing six classes, sometimes seven. The quarter system has broken that up for students and had them focus on less at a time. And I think that was crucial in a time where they were doing the majority of the work on their own. So the idea was to allow students to focus on less in hopes that they would be more successful. I think our heart still hurts for our our distance learners, you know, like it's hard not to to worry about them. And that's I think one of the things as counselors that we struggle with is trying to get to all of those students in the distance learning environment. I think there have been some elements of distance learning that have um, created new avenues for us to connect with students. I would say how to connect with us as counselors hopefully will become easier. I know we've had numerous one-on-one -on -one Zooms with students. Um, you know, phone calls constantly. We have two awesome academic advisors in this office that also support that. We made lots and lots of phone calls home just even to see like, hey, are you still coming to Valhalla? We were fortunate enough to be able to hire Ms. Defoni this year, who's excellent um, technology-wise. I came on um, as someone who was also kind of tech savvy. I got hired and had immediately been given responsibility of uh, updating our website. It's just continuous outreach and I think that's that's hard but it's the work that we have to do if we're going to try to to support those students since they're they're not here on campus. There's so many stories um, but especially as a as a new school counselor you know they tell me like I'm not going to forget this and you know you've really you've really changed my life. So one of my um, great successes, I think, this year is in working with students who didn't have a lot of support at home, but through some of our extended opportunities, we were able to help them through that process. You know, coming from a country that was in the middle of war when they were kids and finding a way to this country and being able to provide that support for students and seeing them get into such incredible universities and coming alongside them to help them with that process has been um, a great honor for me. It is every year, but I think especially in a time of COVID, it's been a particular honor. There's, there's students doing really well. Like there's um, students learning new things about themselves. So I guess those conversations have been awesome, you know, finding new talents like sewing or cooking. Some of my more recent success stories is with the seniors, just getting the calls or the emails or the visits in. Like I got into Long Beach, like I got into NYU. I mean, that's huge. I, I've had a number of students that I can speak about their success throughout this year, but I think one that really stands out to me is um, a young lady who had to really step away from her academics to support her family. Um, and so, being able to help a student through that, um, it just impacts me as a counselor. Just kind of confirms that like, I'm doing the right thing because Throughout this process, throughout this this year, um, I feel like we've always we've always been second guessing ourselves and trying to determine if we're doing the right things.